okay next we are going to determine automorphism groups of cyclic groups this we will do in two examples in the first one we are going to consider uh, all finite cyclic groups and in the second one the infinite cyclic group we know I'll be already know that up to isomorphism there is exactly one finite cyclic group for a given order uh, and also up to isomorphism there is a unique cyclic group that is infinite so let us see the finite case first This is example 281. Let G be a finite cyclic group of order R. So that means R is some positive integer. We see the trivial case first, uh, the one where R is 0. If R, uh, sorry, I mean where R is 1. If R is 1, then G has only one element that is G consists of only the identity element. In this case A of G, which is the group of all bijective mappings on G, also consists of only one mapping, which is the identity mapping on G. This is because if you consider a mapping from a singleton set into itself, which also has to be bijective, then there is only one such mapping which maps the single element to itself and that map is nothing but the identity map on this singleton set. In other words, the identity map on G. And now since we know that the automorphism group of G is a subgroup of this, so this also should consist of only the identity automorphism because Besides being a bijection on this set, I is also an automorphism. This we already have seen. Okay, so in this case, hence In other words, the automorphism group is itself the trivial group if the original group is the trivial group. Next, now we can go to the non-trivial case where R is greater than 1. Okay. Since G is cyclic of order R, we have then being cyclic means being generated by some element. So G also will be generated by some element A. for some 
element A of order R in G. The order of the element should also be equal to the order of the group. Then only it will be, uh, it, the group itself will be a cyclic group. Okay. Now we want to figure out uh, the, all the automorphisms of this group. So let us start by considering an arbitrary automorphism. Let T be an automorphism of G. Note that for any integer i lying between 0 and r minus 1 we have And this is uh, possible because T being capital T being an automorphism is a homomorphism. You can see this in the special case where I is equal to 2. Since T is a homomorphism, we will have A T A T. So, in for a general I, uh, in this range also, this is true. Now, what is the implication of this last equation? The implication is that to know what capital T does to all the elements of G, we don't have to know that separately for every element. If we know what capital T does to A, then the other images are automatically determined that we can see from this equation. So we write the conclusion thus T is completely determined by its uh, I mean the image of A under T. We, uh, it's enough to know just that. So we are now going to focus our attention on A T. Now we want to know what A T can possibly be. One thing we already know is that whatever A T is, it is after all again an element in G. So that's where we are now going to start. Since AT belongs to G, AT is equal to A to the power T for some integer. T lying between 0 and r minus 1 because it has to again be an element of G capital G and the elements of G look like this okay now what we uh, want to next show is that T actually cannot be equal to 0 suppose to show that to the contrary suppose t is equal to 0 then what we get from this equation is this a t is a to the power 0 in the group in any group this integral power is the identity which is also equal to et because t is a homomorphism so 
it maps the identity element uh, onto again an identity element in this case both the identity elements are the same because t maps g into itself okay now t besides being a homomorphism is also one to one in fact t is everything it's an automorphism it is a homomorphism it's one to one and it's onto we will now use the one to oneness of t here because using that we can now conclude that a is equal to e since t is one to one this implies a is equal to e but then r which is order of a is equal to 1 because we know that in any group the identity element has order 1 and this directly contradicts our assumption that r is greater than 1 a contradiction so our supposition is wrong that is t cannot be equal to 0 that means t has to be a positive integer and at the same time being less than or equal to r minus 1 is equivalent to being less than r so that means if our capital t is an automorphism then this exponent is a positive integer less than r we will now show that not only this but this exponent uh, also has to be relatively prime to r that is the next thing we want to show we now show that the gcd of t and r is equal to 1 don't forget that this notation means the GCD of T and R in this book. So for that, let D be a positive integer such that d divides both t and r if we can show that d is 1 it will mean that t and r have precisely one common divisor which is positive and that is 1 so that will also be the greatest common divisor proving uh, what we want to show okay now We calculate this. The r by dth power of the element at. Note that r by d is a positive integer because d divides r. This is equal to this which using the rules of exponent we can write this as this now just like uh, oh sorry see i wrote the exact opposite thing
just like d divides r b also divides t so again using this rule of exponents this is equal to t divided by d now r is the order of a so this inner element becomes identity so this is equal to identity so the r by dth power of a t is identity we now know what uh, we have to do next if this happens then the order of a t divides the positive integer r by d and this follows from an exercise which we have uh, used many times before uh, I think it's exercise number 36 in which section I don't remember at present but since we have used this result many times we will just simply write hence we get from this we get the next thing Thus, order of a t divides r by d. Since r is equal to order of a is equal to order of a t, we have r dividing r by d we have seen in the previous video that any automorphism um, it does not change the order of an element if you apply the automorphism on an element the resulting element also has the same order as the original element so now r divides r by d This implies since R and R by D are both positive integers. So this implies R is less than or equal to R by D. Or D is less than or equal to 1. But at the same time since D is a positive integer we thus have the only possibility for d to be a positive integer and at the same time to be less than or equal to 1 is when d is 1. So, 1 is the only common positive divisor of T and R. So T and R are relatively prime. We now know something about A T. Namely, it will be A to the power T for some T lying in this range where T is a positive integer less than R and relatively prime to R. We now see a sort of converse to this, uh, namely we are now going to consider a function which is like this, where the exponent is a positive integer less than r and relatively prime to r. We will then show that such a function actually is an automorphism of g. Once we do that, we will uh, then have established a one-to-one -one correspondence between automorphisms of G and positive integers less than R and relatively prime to R. From that correspondence, we will be able to show that the automorphism group of G is actually isomorphic to this group, UR, which you recall is the group of all congruence classes modulo r where 
the representatives are um, well the representatives are relatively prime to r and of course they are non zero in other words I, i'm not saying the representatives are non zero okay instead of me blabbering let me write exactly what i'm trying to say here this is a congruence class modulo r where this is not equal to the zero congruence class that means i is not congruent to zero mod r and i and r are relatively prime we know that this set is a group under the operation multiplication modulo r so that group is ur we are now going to show that this is isomorphic to ur and essentially this will tell us that the automorphism group of g is nothing but ur so in that sense we will then have determined the automorphism group of g okay so let us now accordingly proceed conversely let us consider the map s from g to g defined by this formula i s where s is a positive integer less than r and relatively prime to r okay now the first job is to show that this function is well defined that you already know has two parts the first thing we need to make sure is that um, all the images are in G and they are because after all any image you see here is an integral power of A because S is a positive integer and I is some integer. In fact we know what I is. Um, okay no but uh, here I have something to say. You see, the way we have defined this map, we are not actually mentioning what i is. Ideally, if you want, you can mention where i is a, an integer satisfying these inequalities. That is because g looks like this. Okay. But we know that every element in G has, it actually has many different representations. The exponent that we see above A, it can be changed. For example, in place of this representation, the same element can also be written as A to the power R plus 1 since a to the power r is identity so by the rules of exponent these two elements are actually equal so what i we are using here that actually matters because ultimately that is used in the image so we cannot immediately say just from the definition of s that we are go going to get a unique image for 
every input that uniqueness has to be somehow proved then only it will be s capital s will be well defined anyway so let us do that now we are not going to even mention that the images lie in g that is obvious but the uniqueness part we have to say something let i and j since we haven't mentioned anything about i so we are going to take i and j to be any integers okay let i and j be integers such that these elements that oh but uh, okay yes we do have to say uh, something about the uniqueness but showing that is not a very big deal that is because from this equality we it implies that the s powers of these elements which are actually the same element are also equal then we have used uh, one of the rules of exponents here now use this equality again use that rule of exponents this is equal to so if the inputs are equal then so are the outputs so that's why capital s is well defined fine the simpler the better hence capital S is well defined okay now now we have to show all the things one by one first let us show that capital S is a homomorphism and then it is one to one and then it is on to since we have already taken uh, i and j for this purpose let us take something else let a to the power alpha comma a to the power beta belong to g where uh, again of course alpha and beta are some integers note that uh, alpha and beta can be any integer but since capital G is a group, so these powers of A are going to be elements in G itself. G is finite. So what I'm trying to say here is that there are infinitely many choices for alpha and beta each. But we are still going to get an element in G. Then we need to calculate this first of all inside using usual rule of exponent we have this and then using the definition of s alpha plus beta times s in the exponent we have ordinary integers so this is alpha s plus beta s distributive law is true in the ring of integers and now we use uh, the law law of exponent one of the laws of exponent again alpha s beta s 
so this is the first one is the s image of a to the power alpha and the second one is the s image of a to the power beta so that's it this implies S is a homomorphism okay let us next show that S is one to one let a to the power i prime comma a to the power j prime belong to g such that their s images are the same then a to the power i prime s is equal to a to the power j prime s okay now it's time to use the fact that this integer s is relatively prime to r since the gcd of s and r is equal to 1 there exist integers let us take mu and nu such that this combination mu s plus nu r is equal to one now a to the power i prime so we have assumed that the outputs are equal now if we can show that the inputs are equal then that will imply capital s is one to one and that's what we will we are going to do now we can write uh, one exponent here now in place of one we are uh, going to use this mu s plus nu r use the rules of exponents and you have i prime mu s times i prime nu we can arrange the integers like this okay now in place of uh, oh, okay instead of uh, keeping the s outside we keep it inside because then we can use this condition using that condition we have j prime s mu on the other hand here we have identity so this is equal to j prime s mu now since any integral power of identity is again the identity all of them are equal so in place of excuse me i prime nu we can put um, j prime nu also same nothing will change j prime s all to the power mu now this again becomes a to the power r j prime nu 
again using the rules of exponent and arranging everything of oh, this is j prime sorry we have j prime all to the power mu s plus mu r which is 1 and that is equal to a to the power j prime so uh, the hypothesis that the outputs are equal implies that the inputs this one and this one are also equal thus s is 1 to 1 now recall an exercise exercise 8 of section 1.2 in section 1.2 we saw functions and there we proved something like this a set was given to us don't confuse this s with this s okay i am uh, stating the that exercise a finite set s was given and a function stigma from s into itself was given but in that exercise, we have shown that if sigma is 1 to 1, then sigma is also on 2. And finiteness of S helped us show that. In fact, uh, I think there is a third part also. If sigma is 1 to 1, then sigma is on 2. And in another part, we, have, we showed that if sigma is on 2, then it is also 1 to 1. And I think there is a third part also where we showed that this is not necessarily true if S is infinite. We can now use that result here. Why you see now our S or where S is this function is a function from G into itself. So S is the kind of function that we had in that exercise. And our G is also finite because it is a finite group and we have already proved now that S is 1 to 1. So automatically S is also 1 to uh, by this exercise. So for on to ness we do not have to do anything. By exercise 8 of section 1.2 then s is on to as well so s is an automorphism of G. So these two things, the previous one and this one establishes a one-to-one -one correspondence between the automorphisms of G and the positive integers less than R and relatively prime to R. Okay. Now we can define uh, that isomorphism that we finally want. And that thing is going to be done like this. But before we do that, let us define a notation. The notation will be defined like this. For let us write it in another paragraph. For an integer i, which is a positive integer less than r, 
such that i is relatively prime to r we denote the automorphism t by the notation ti where a t is equal to a to the power i okay if t is an automorphism then we have already seen uh, ima imagine that small t here we have already seen that when we apply t to a it the image looks like this and this i is a positive integer less than r and relatively prime to r and the converse also we have shown here namely all such functions are automorphisms of g now that means um, this correspondence between t and i allows us to label t using i so we are denoting this automorphism so that we can recognize which t is associated with which i we are denoting it by t i okay note that this notation only makes sense when i is a positive integer less than r and relatively prime to r fine now we are going to define a function define a function psi from u r to the automorphism group of g by this formula u r means uh, any element in u r will be an a special type of congruence class modulo r so it will look like this its psi image is defined to be equal to t i prime where i prime is the remainder on division of i by r okay this is our function now we need to say i mean we need to justify everything uh, the first job we have now is we have to show that this i is well defined the things we need to show for this nothing here is obvious this i prime that we have used here is this use legitimate in this sense is this i prime a positive integer less than r and relatively prime to r we have to make sure of that first because then only this is an automorphism of g and it will belong to this and then we will uh, next come to the question of uniqueness of this that is also not obvious so let us start hmm. let this belong to u r this is any element in u r then
according to the definition of the group u r i is an integer not divisible by r that is and uh, this condition is coming from this because the elements in u r are congruence classes modulo r which are non zero congruence classes modulo r where the representatives are all uh, relatively prime to r non zeroness of this congruence class implies the integer i is incongruent to the integer 0 modulo r and that if you just simply translate in the language of divisibility implies that r does not divide i and i is relatively prime to r okay now if i prime is the remainder on division of i by r so if you divide i by r you can do that because r is a positive integer and in fact recall that r in our case now is greater than 1 mm -hmm. so you can divide i by r you will get a quotient and a remainder by the euclidean algorithm and that remainder is a is going to be a positive integer why because r does not divide i had r divided i the remainder would be equal to zero the remainder would have been exactly equal to zero but because of this non divisibility the remainder will be strictly greater than 0 and we know that the remainder always is uh, less than the divisor. The divisor in this case is r so it is less than r and i prime is also relatively prime to r when the number you are dividing by r is relatively prime to r the remainder also has to be relatively prime to r why that you can uh, figure out using the uh, euclidean algorithm or if you go to section 1.3 where we discussed these aspects of elementary number theory there we will you will see that uh, somewhere we have state something about this oh the place that you have to go precisely to figure this out is in that exercise which tells us how to find the greatest common divisor of two given integers do you recall an exercise where we uh, formulated a sort of algorithm where we divide one integer by the other get a remainder and then uh, divide the divisor by the remainder and then repeat the proceed procedure again and again until we get a zero remainder the first non-zero remainder is the gct in the solution to that exercise you will see that if this is one then this is also equal to one Okay, so now what can we say from this? 
Now, the way we have defined this function psi uh, for this congruence class, its psi image will be equal to this, where i prime is the remainder. Now, it makes sense to write t i prime because i prime is not only a positive integer less than r, but it's also relatively prime to r. So, you, we can use this notation. Thus, T i prime is an automorphism of G. And in this, in writing T i prime, we have also uh, used the fact that we can in fact write the notation because of these uh, conditions on i prime being satisfied okay now we come to the uniqueness of t i prime next let i and okay not just simply i and j but this congruence classes in u r such that they are equal okay let i prime and j prime be the remainders I said that every part of this uh, thing that we are doing is non-trivial it's because you see a single congruence class in U R actually has more than one representation for this equality it's not necessary to have I equal to J I mean the integer I equal to the integer J in place of i, you can also write the integer r plus i. That congruence class, the congruence class that that integer gives r plus i is also equal to this congruence class. So, uh, you, it's not trivial that uh, the psi images are also equal. So, we are now going to show that. Let this be the remainders on division of i and j by r respectively okay then i is congruent to i prime mod r and j is congruent to j prime mod r but also this equality implies that i is congruent to j mod r. So, using the fact that congruence modulo r is an equivalence relation, we have this. Thus, i prime is congruent to j prime mod r. Okay. This implies, this implies what? R divides I prime minus J prime and hence R also divides 
the absolute value of i prime minus j prime since i prime and j prime are positive integers less than r we have okay so what is the absolute value of i prime minus j prime we don't know what whether i prime and j prime are equal or not so the absolute value is always greater than or equal to zero and the absolute value is less than r right exactly why is the absolute value less than r that i leave to you to figure out we have already uh, done this type of calculations before okay now you combine these inequalities with this divisibility uh, r divides this means this is a multiple of r but at the same time it's a non-negative integer multiple of r because the this integer itself is non-negative but at the same time it is less than r so all the non-negative multiples of r are 0 r 2 r 3 r etc now this one can be none of these so it must be equal to 0 Hence, this is equal to zero. Which implies I prime is equal to J prime. So, this is equal to t i prime is equal to t j prime because i prime and j prime are the same thing and that is the sign image of this so if inputs are equal then so are the outputs that proves the uniqueness now we can say that psi is well defined thus psi is well defined we have to do this much to just say that psi is well defined okay now one by one we start showing that next psi is a homomorphism is one to one and on to so let us start let u and v be two elements in u r okay let u prime comma v prime be the remainders on division of u and v by r respectively so that uh, u psi is uh, t u prime and v psi is t v prime 
on. TV Prime. From this, we have, okay, I need ink. T U prime T V prime where you should understand that there is composition of function in between these two because these are after all not just functions they are automorphisms on the other hand what happens when we compose U and V now let K be the remainder on division of the integer u v by r then U V sign. What is this? First of all, these two congruence classes, when multiplied, give us this congruence class. So this is equal to according to our definition of psi this is t k okay now we want to uh, say that these two automorphisms this t k and t u prime t v prime are actually the same to prove that um, okay should we uh, come down to the level of elements in g or can be just somehow using the fact that these integers are related in this and that way say directly that this function is equal to this let me just see what hint i have written here oh it's better to um, use elements of g for any integer gamma lying between 0 and r minus 1. Uh, so we are going to consider a general element in G. What is this? T u prime T v prime. What do we get when we apply this function on that element? By the definition of composition, we have to first apply T u prime and then on the result we apply T v prime. So by the definition of these functions, gamma u prime.
and then u prime c prime oh sorry uh, not this but actually equal to this mm. so this is one thing and if we apply tk on that same element then we have gamma k if we can now show that these two elements are equal in g then we are done for that we now use this relations what exactly are u prime and v prime they are remainders when we divide u and v by r respectively and k is the remainder when we divide u v by r now because of uh, these facts u is congruent to u prime mod r v is congruent to v prime mod r and u v is congruent to k modulo r okay so what can we say thus u prime v prime using real uh, properties of this relation is congruent to u v um, multiplying this two, two congruences and using the third one this is congruent to k mod r so the integers u prime v prime and k are congruent to each other modulo r this implies u prime v prime minus k will be divisible by r so there will be an integer some integer uh, stay what can we take that integer to be let us take that as w for some integer w because then this difference between q prime v prime and k is divisible by r okay now we can use this relation here then a to the power gamma u prime v prime is equal to a to the power gamma times wr plus k so using everything we know this can be written as a to the power r whole to the power gamma w times a to the power gamma k since r is the order of a this is e So this becomes a to the power gamma k so the effect of these two functions one is this function and the other one is tk on any fixed element in g are the same so the functions are the same thus which implies so
u psi v psi is equal to u v psi. This proves that psi is a homomorphism. Okay. Next, we want to show that psi is one to one. Is that what I have shown? Mm -hmm. Next. i j u v w alpha beta everything we have taken um, but we haven't exhausted all the letters yet next let let us take oh uh, I hope we have uh, okay. See, A is the generator of G. We cannot take that. So let us take B and C. Such that If B prime and C prime are the remainders, we have to write this again and again. Uh, we don't have any choice on or uh, since we are we, we see that we are uh, required to write this again and again, you can also do something else. You can uh, invent another notation where if you have uh, an integer say i, you can say that i prime will denote the remainder on division of i by r. So in place of i, if you have any other integer, uh, that integer prime will denote the remainder. If you do that in the uh, appropriate place in the solution before these things start, before defining psi, then you don't have to write this this many times, the same thing. The remainders on division, of, but since we haven't done that, so we have to write the, keep on writing this. B and C by R. respective I don't have the solution entirely written here so that's why uh, things are not as smooth you, you can see me struggling here and there I have just written the hints down writing the entire solution down is impractical and it's not needed also we can do it here itself so if these are remainders respectively then we have T B prime is equal to T C prime. Now, since, okay, now, oh, okay, okay, but from this itself, we have to say something about B prime and C prime. Mm. because then using that we can uh, we ultimately have to say that these two elements are equal so
a to the power b prime is equal to a t b prime so if these two automatisms are equal then their uh, the images of a under them are also equal which implies a to the power b prime minus c prime equal to identity hence order of a divides b prime minus c prime that is r divides b prime minus c prime now uh, concluding that b prime and c prime are actually equal follows just like what we did previously with i prime and j prime uh, they are absolute differences divisible by r but at the same time their absolute difference is a non negative integer less than r so the absolute difference must be equal to zero so we are not going to write those things again this implies b prime is equal to c prime or do we have to go to uh, i mean go that far is it not uh, automatically okay mm -hmm. we don't have to go that far that is b prime is congruent to c prime mod r since b is congruent to b prime mod r and c is congruent to c prime mod r we thus have b is congruent to c mod r but when this happens the corresponding congruence classes are the same so that's how uh, the assumption that the psi images of these congruence classes are the same has led us to the conclusion that the congruence classes themselves are the same so psi is 1 to 1 that is psi is now a an isomorphism because it's a homomorphism and 1 to 1 that is psi is an isomorphism okay now finally we have to show that psi is onto for that uh, take any element from the second group that is any automorphism of g next let t be any automorphism of g then in the beginning of this example we have shown something we have already seen that there exists an integer a 
positive integer actually such that t and r are relatively prime and a t is equal to a to the power t then okay then according to that notation t i t suffix i then t is equal to t t which is nothing but the psi image of this not this thing carefully okay first of all because of the nature of t t suffix small t makes sense and it in fact is equal to t that's how we are labeling all the automorphisms of uh, the group g and in fact this is true for any automorphism of g that we have shown in the beginning itself and according to the definition of psi this is nothing but the um, psi image of this congruence class t is after all again an integer and we can consider the congruence class uh, that t belongs to so this is equal to this note that this is important this actually belongs to u r because um, these inequalities tell us that t is not divisible by r so the congruence class modulo r containing t is not equal to the zero congruence class moreover this t is relatively prime to r so this congruence class satisfies all the conditions to be in this group and that's why that's why we can in fact apply psi to this in the first place hence psi is onto so our psi is now an isomorphism of u r onto this so these two groups are isomorphic thus we finally have the automorphism group of g isomorphic to u r and in fact uh, this among many other things tells us that for the cyclic group of order r where r is a positive integer there are exactly this many automorphisms of uh, the cyclic group because this is the order of u r and that should also be the order of this okay so this is example 281 now we go to the case of the infinite cyclic group let g be an infinite cyclic group this example was long but it is what it is we have finally shown this thing and that's what matters is an infinite cyclic group that is G is equal to A where 
A is an element in G. This is such that a to the power i is equal to identity. For an integer i, if and only if i is equal to 0. This is another way of saying that a is of infinite order and accordingly g is an infinite cyclic group. Okay. Let t be just like before we start by considering any automorphism of g. Let t be an automorphism of G. Same strategy now also. Since a t belongs to G, we have a t equal to a to the power t for some integer t. Okay. Now next, oh, exactly this will not give us anything in this case. Instead, something else, uh, not the element a t, but the element a itself. Since this is not exactly the way to go. Since T is onto and A belongs to G, we have A equal to, so A itself will be the output uh, of some input under T. Let that input be A to the power I. for some integer okay but then again and now we have to consider what we were considering before since a t belongs to g a t is equal to, let us this time take a to the power s. For some integer s. We need this to figure out the image of a to the power i under t. Because uh, that fact continues to be true irrespective of whether g is a finite cyclic group or infinite. The fact that T is entirely determined by the image A T that determines all the images. So that's why we are writing this. Then or now what do we get from these two things? A is equal to Keep in mind that this equation is true even when i is a negative integer. Hmm. 
using the rules of exponent we have si so which implies a to the power si minus 1 is equal to 0. Now use the this condition or oh, we will uh, confuse ourselves with this i. So let us take j here. is j minus 1. So this type of integral power of a is sorry this is identity if and only if the exponent is 0. Hence s j minus 1 is equal to 0 or s j is equal to 1. Since s and j are integers either both of them are equal to 1 or both of them are equal to minus 1. So the point here is this we don't really care about j s is either 1 or minus 1. Thus, a t is either equal to a or a t is equal to a to the power minus 1 or a inverse. Accordingly, t is either the identity mapping because if a t is a then for any integer i a to the power i t is also a to the power i because of this where is it this part of the equations. So either t is the identity automorphism or t is the automorphism um, let us call it something j which maps every element of g onto its inverse. We already know that i is actually an automorphism of g. i is an automorphism of every group. Uh, but this other one, the map that maps every group element onto its inverse is also an automorphism. Why? that I leave to you to figure. In fact, we have already done this uh, because our group is cyclic, so it's an abelian group and in an abelian group, this particular map is a homomorphism and it's very easy to show that this is one to one and onto, so it's an automorphism. So for the infinite cyclic group, the automorphism group is very easy. It has exactly two elements, i and j. Thus, the automorphism group of G is I and J. So, the automorphism group has two elements and we know that up to isomorphism there is precisely one group with two elements. 
which is the cyclic group generated by or uh, we can just simply say the cyclic group of order 2. So in the finite case the situation is somewhat complicated in the infinite case it's not so infinity is not always necessarily complicated than finiteness so this ends this section i mean the results after this we have the exercises but uh, that i think uh, it's better to Shall we uh, see at least uh, why I am not uh, trying to start the exercises is because in the beginning itself we have to answer uh, that part where we had that uh, very vague paragraph that we were complaining about in the last video where we used a group and an automorphism to create or construct some non-abelian groups. Do you recall that cyclic group of order 7 and where this function which we said is an automorphism of that cyclic group of order 7 which itself is an automorphism of order 3 and then somehow uh, Herstein suggests that we can create a non abelian group of order 21 and then a general version of this particular example. We have to next justify all those things uh, in full detail and without any doubt. So that I think will it's better to do in the next video. So I end this one here itself. So we will see those things and we will start the proper exercises in the next video, hopefully. But I don't think I will be able to. So the next video, I think, will be entirely taken up by uh, those two things because they are just like the finite cycling group case today. They are somewhat messy. Okay, so we will see that. So if you have anything to say regarding these things or any other thing related to mathematics, you can comment in the comment section below or you can mail me at my usual address here. So until the next video, uh, this is me, Lucifer, from a mathematical room. Have a nice night.